Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all here at three in the morning. Thanks for coming. <laughs> so one of the things I like to talk about a lot is writing code. And most of my talks are about that experience. But I've, through the years, I've deployed a lot of things too. A lot of people say, until you've shipped code, you haven't really lived. Uh, because shipping code could be an adventure. So once you're done writing the code, the question is, how do you actually get it up onto a website somewhere so you can see it, so people can experience it? Have you ever asked yourself the question, I wish I could find some other really great examples of Angular apps, right? And you want to go look for them. A lot of times they're inside of enterprise companies and you can't go look at what they've done, but we can see the end result on the web. So today we're going to talk about what do you do after development is done? Because once you're done developing, I mean, you can finish writing your code the same day it's due to go live, right? It's just easy. Just press a button and it goes live. So there's things we should be doing and thinking about at that point. So one of the things I like to start with is once you're done writing code, it's time to look at the code and make sure it's been optimized. And obviously, we want to think about this as we're building our code, too. Performance is important. And with Angular, there's a lot of things we can do that are come out of the box to help us optimize our code. So we'll start there by looking at what we can do with uh, Angular to optimize it. And then we're going to look at how we can build Angular, and not just by running ng-build, but how we actually package it up. And then finally, how do we deploy it? Um, there's multiple ways to deploy our web apps to the cloud. I recently was working with my team, and we documented over seven just in about two minutes talking about it. And then afterwards, I thought of another seven. So there's multiple ways to get your code to the cloud. You might zip it. You might use GitHub. You might use a cloud provider. You might use your internal providers. You might use Docker. Lots of ways that you can actually deploy. So let's take a look at these in this story and figure out how do we look at our applications to optimize and build them and deploy them to the cloud, starting with building Angular. We all know that we can use the Angular CLI to build and scaffold our apps. It gets a lot of praise for how we build our applications and we run them and it creates components. That's awesome. And it can't be understated how nice it is that it does this for us. But the piece that we don't talk about as often is if we build our Angular apps through the CLI, it's putting a lot of stuff around our code that makes it easier to build, optimize, and deploy our code as well. Things like our Webpack configuration, for example. How many of you enjoy diving into a 500-line file of Webpack trying to figure out how to tweak it? I don't see too many hands. I see Mike Brocky saying yes. He's on the CLI team. So what we like to do is look at personas when I work with deploying code. When you build with the Angular CLI, there's really two personas. There's the I'm a developer and I'm writing code and I want to write my code, build it, and see it in the browser. Write my code, build it, see it in the browser. Write some more code, debug it, see it in the browser. I might do this dozens, maybe even hundreds of times a day. So in that persona, a, development, a developer has a need to be fast with the build and to see the results quickly. That means we sacrifice some things. Do I care if there's cache busting for a development build on my local machine? No, I'm just going to turn off caching in my browser and let it keep going. Do I care if it's going to take 10 to 15 seconds to build it versus two or three? Yes. If I'm going to run it 100 times a day, I don't want to be waiting for it. There was times early in the JavaScript world where we would build, it would take minutes to do this stuff, especially if you didn't have an SSD on your computer. So this persona is your developer and you want to get things fast. That's where ng-build really comes into play. The second persona is you are somebody who wants to put out to a user, a production build. Your users don't care if the, what you did and built fast or not. They don't ever experience that. They just want to know when they hit your website, it works and it's fast. So for this, we have ng-build-prod, which now has the build optimizer turned on by default. And that helps us optimize our builds. This does more things to make the build smaller and to make them faster once the user hits them. So our personas are developer, ng-build. A user, we're going to use ng-build-prod. So with this, we should kind of explore what are the differences between these two flags. Uh, I'm going to show some of the, the main ones that I'm interested in. So when I build large apps and I want to make sure that I've got my sites running in under a second and a half for the first time to load, something like that, it's important to understand what I have to do differently. First, I might have different environments in my application. Five things that run different in development versus prod, we've got environment files that we can use. Cache busting. When you deploy a new version of your app, do you want to have to go call over your end users and say, could you please, like, you know, 
refresh your cache in your browser? Probably not. So cache busting becomes really important, sticking some kind of random numbers at the end of your file names, basically. That's really important if you're going to like an Amazon.com or Walmart or any of the large companies that deploy websites. Uh, source maps. Do you want source maps for production? Probably not. Why deliver more stuff to the browser than you need to? But in development mode, I do. I'd like to debug my code, unless you're like Mike and you don't write errors in your code. So be like Mike. Uglification, one of my favorite words in JavaScript. Make your code look ugly. Do we want to uglify our code for production? Yes. Basically turn all your variables to X, Y, and Z. Make them smaller in size. Get rid of comments and spacing. Bundling, do I want to bundle in both these? Actually, it's easier to do it in both. It really doesn't cost a lot more, so we actually bundle with both, but the bundles are slightly different in the prod version. We get the cache busting, we get a couple extra things. Code splitting. Do we want to make sure that we can deliver certain things lazy loaded in our application? Yes, and it's actually nice to have that at development time too, so we can test that functionality. Ahead of time compilation, we're gonna get that with a prod build for Angular. Get all those extra performance tweaks, but not at dev time. And then tree shaking. We get some tree shaking at build time as well. Dead code removal. One of these days, I'm going to bring a tree with me and shake it and see all the code fall out. But it's kind of a cool visual, isn't it? You think about, I've got all this code. And when you're writing a small app, like a demo, you're not going to see a lot of dead code fall out. But if you work on an app for a week, a month, a year, I've worked on apps for over a year with over 100 developers. Can you imagine the kind of technical debt that you accumulate? And then when you go back and look, you're not going to remember everything you no longer use. So it's kind of cool to have some tool that will go in there and remove that dead code for you. So in the end, the CLI is doing a lot of this work to make it smaller for us. Let's take a look at how some of that works, though. All righty. So we have an application here. I'll put it inside a code. It's called Angular Event View. And this app has about seven different modules, six of which are lazy loaded. So I have a bunch of bundles in this application. I want to make sure that all the features I'm using, Angular Material, RxJS, Angular itself, that they're all bundled the right way, and I get my production build built out of them. So let's go into Terminal, make this a little bit bigger. And if I run ng, build right here without any additional flags. Let's kind of get an idea of what's going to happen with our bundles. So first, it's putting the application together. It's putting our chunks. Chunks are basically our bundles, different files. And it's labeling those out for us. And here we can see a couple different modules. Anytime we see a dot module, that's one of the modules that we created. It's our code. We can see the sizes. Some of these are kind of small, like 5K, 13K. Am I going to spend time optimizing a 5K file? I'm not. It's not going to be worth my effort. Maybe I get it from 5.6K down to 5.2. Uh, what's the benefit there at that point? But I might focus on something that's a little bit bigger. Maybe like this vendor file down here that's, oh, 4 meg. 4 meg's kind of big, right? And it's running really fast since my web server is also my laptop on my machine. But what happens if I put this on a real web server and I try to hit it from a mobile phone at a conference Wi-Fi, or in a country or a place, maybe like Australia or New Zealand, which doesn't have great internet speeds. That becomes a problem. So the next thing we can do is we can run it with the prod flag. And once we run with the prod flag, this build will take a little bit longer. It'll show us some more information. And maybe the bundles will change a little bit, too. We can look at some of the examples of what's happening. So here, the first set of bundles, notice, don't have any cache busting. All the names are pretty readable. Ad, it's got admin, module, chunk, JS. We can see our inline bundle, main bundle, our polyfills bundle. When we get a production build, we get the cache busting built into the file names, which will automatically change whenever those assets change via Webpack. So now we get chunks in here, and there's ways you can set it up so you can have readable names on these two with the CLI. But just to show you, you get these cache busted file names, the file sizes were even smaller than they were originally, which is nice, because we have more optimization. But what happened to the vendor file? Thank you, CLI. You completely removed the 4 meg file, didn't you? It's not even there. Mike Brocky just decided he's going to throw away all of our vendor files. Angular's not even in it. What actually happens here is the vendor file gets merged into the main file. So notice the main file is 500K. 
If we go back up, we had 100K and 4.05 meg. So we went from basically 4.1 meg all the way down to half a meg just by running a single flag in there, which is nice. And we get all those additional features out of the box. There's a little more we can do too. And I've got a tool here called Webpack Bundle Analyzer, which will show you a lot of this. Oops, that's the wrong file. So if you install, there's actually three of these I wanted to show. If you install either Webpack Bundle Analyzer or the Webpack Visualizer plugin, either one of these will help you look inside of what the Webpack tool did to build your code. Why this is important is because you can now see possible areas of improvement to look at inside your code or you might be using something you don't know you're using. So we can run these tools using Source Map Explorer or the Webpack Bundle Analyzer. And what we get is something like this. Gets a visualization inside the browser we can dive into. And often what I'll do, and for a while it seemed like I was always looking for RxJS because I've often found people when I went to consult with them would be including all of RxJS inside their application. And they're only using map and catch maybe, you know, two or three operators which was overkill, right? We don't want to use everything and pull it all in if we're not using it. So a tool like this can identify how big is that file and what's inside of it. And the larger the rectangle, the larger the size, and you hover over them, it'll show you the size in K. And then if you click into them, you can dive in and see every file that it's included inside of there, which is really nice. You can even see your own code as you dive in. So we have these tools that help us use it and optimize it, and once we get it right, once we get our file size down to where we want it to be, and we get our application code split the way we want it to be with those chunks, the next step, which we don't often think about, is how do we make it work everywhere? I worked at a company not so long ago where we had Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10, multiple versions of Linux that were out there, and multiple versions of Mac OS. And they were all the developer machines. We all wrote code differently. Running node modules, things run differently on different operating systems too. And then when you deploy to a CI server, that CI server, you have no control over what operating system is running or maybe the version of node. And then who knows what your cloud server is actually running for, uh, for OS or versions of node or NPM. The most common bug I would find when people built their code, they'd make one change, rebuild it, try to deploy it, and it would break, is somebody somewhere in that chain changed their version of node or NPM. And all heck broke loose. So how do you not worry about that? You just don't deploy, right? And that's the end of my talk. No, that's not the answer. So let's think about what we want out of deployment. We want to make sure we have to install our dependencies. What did we do when we started our project? We installed our NPM dependencies and everything else we needed. We built our Angular assets. We handled all that. OK, we're going to run NP, uh, ng build. We're going to build our Express server or ASP.NET or Java server, whatever we're going to build together. We want to make sure that that's ready to deploy. And effectively, we want to copy it to a, dist a distribution folder where we can FTP it, GitHub deploy, CI. We want to get that set of assets, the whole project, the assets, Angular, the dependencies, and maybe our node server, all to the cloud. So making sure that the version of node we have is important. Let me ask you a question. When you build your application locally and you've got your version of Node, let's say 6.11, and you've got NPM, I don't know, 5.0, if you package and zip that folder up on your local machine and then send that to a web server, are you guaranteed it's going to work? Do you feel confident about that? Yes, Simona does. Right, problem we have is we zip our stuff locally. First, it takes a while, right? Because you're zipping all your stuff up. But once you get it there, what if they're running Node 8.9? and you're running Node 6.11. You don't know all these things, so it's hard to figure out what's going to happen. So what we really want is consistency and confidence in our steps. The first step in this is Docker. Docker allows us to basically say, I know what needs to happen to make my code work everywhere. Why don't I just write it down in a little file called a Docker file. I'll give it to whoever needs to build it, and it'll just work the same everywhere. But taking a step back, when I use Docker, one of the problems I had when I first got into it was Docker feels like a black box. I run it, and then I can't look at the files inside of it. I can't check if it's actually working. And I can't debug it. And I write a lot of bugs, unlike Mike. So when I write bugs, I need to be able to debug these things. 
So let's take a look at how we can do all this with Docker. First, Docker is a self-contained script. All the things that we do to build our app, they go in that script. It's a recipe. It's a recipe that you can reproduce over and over again for your app. And it can, can be configured to adapt to different environments. How I run it locally on my machine is not how I'm going to run it in staging. It's not how I'm going to run it in production. I might want to hit real database URLs or use different flags. So Docker files sound daunting, but they're really not. In VS Code, we get some nice color coding of the Docker file. Here's an example of one. We first say, what do I want to use? I want to use this image that comes with Node running on Linux. There's a bunch of open source images that people use all the time up on Docker Hub. And the first one I'm pointing out is, I'm going to use Node 6.11. And you can even specify the patch version if you want to. Then I'm going to set my working directory. I'm going to copy over my package, copy over my source for my server, my express folder. And I'm going to run npm install. Gives me all my express files in there, basically. Then I copy all those over to my image. Next, I'm going to build my app with ng-build. And then I'm going to run an npm install for production. And then I can just expose my port and run node. I know that the versions I have are going to work on that OS, that version of node, with npm, with Angular, and everything's good. All right, so once we do that, we can automate it. We create our Docker file, we build it and run it, and then we can start debugging it. Let's take a look at how this would work. There it is. So in here, we've got a Docker file, and I broke it out with a little more comments. Instead of doing it all in one step, Docker has a nice thing called a multi-step Docker file, multi-stage. Uh, so we're going to break this out here. Once I've got this, we can walk through the different pieces. So first, I actually created my own Docker image. I could have used that Node 6.11 or Node 8.9, one that's up there. But instead, what I did is, like, you know, I don't want to install the Angular CLI every time I do a build. So instead, I created my own Angular CLI Docker image up on Docker Hub. It's called John Pop Angular CLI. And all it does is it grabs that version of Node that I want, Node 8.9. And then it installs the uh, Angular CLI. I think 167 is the one I'm using now for the project. And that's it. It saves me the step of doing an NPM install of the Angular CLI every time. And it's actually using the same version of Node that I wanted anyway. So I grab that. And then I go ahead and I do my NPM install. I build my application. Now, because I'm set setting all this up as client app on line two, that's the staged Docker file. I'm saying, take all this stuff at the top, through lines one through eight, and the result of that image is my Angular app, and I'm naming it client app. It's like a, think of it like a temporary variable in memory. Then I go build my node server. And that one gets put into, on line 11, another temporary variable uh, for the staging called node server. So now I have two images in memory, one called node server, one called client app. I built them separately because they're separate things. And then finally, I said, all right, using Node, this is the image I'm going to deploy. Copy from the Node server, everything in this folder. Copy from the client app, everything in that folder. Expose my port and run Node. The advantage of this, besides being split out and easier to read, because I could do it in one step, is that all those NPM installs and Node modules that I needed to build the app for Express and Angular are not deployed to production. The only things, if you look in lines 20 and 21 that I'm deploying, are the code that I need to run Express and Angular. That's it. So we get everything we need out of the box. Once we do this, we can run Docker a multitude of ways. You can use command line to do it. Uh, you can use VS Code to do it, which is my favorite way. If you go up into the command palette, I could run Docker Compose right there. There's a Docker extension built into VS Code. Now, once that image is there, and this one's running already just to save time, I can actually tap into a few things. So here's my image locally. I can inspect the image and look at what's inside of it. That's the configuration for it. I can run the image. I can tag the image. I can push the image to some kind of a Docker repository, like Docker Hub or an Azure Container Registry or up somewhere up in Google. And then the container is the running instance of that image. I can make as many web services as I want from that image. So I've got a container here. That's green, so it's running. But I wanted to say I, I didn't really trust it. Like, what's in it, right? So I, if I attach the shell to it down here, and I hit LS, 
Now I can see all the files inside of my Docker container that I deployed. And you'll notice there's a public web folder. So if I go into public web, you can see there's my Angular assets. And right at the root, you can see I had index.js. That's my Express server that I'm running. So you can actually inspect these. I can look at the files if I want to. I can say, all right, go ahead and cat the node file. Take a look at it. So now I feel a little bit better. I can see some of the files there. But what if I want to see what's happening with the logs? I could right click. And over here, I can say, show logs. So let's do that. There's my logs. And you notice I'm using Mongo. So I see some mongoose logging kind of going on in there. I can see what's happening. That's great. And up top, says the API is running on this port locally. I can click that, open up in the browser, and there's my application right here. Pretty cool, isn't it? All right, well, what if I want to debug it? I really want to see what's happening. In the debug pane, there's a button up here for debugging. And you have different debug profiles. One of the ones I like to do is Docker attached to Node. If you don't have this one here, all you have to do is hit Add Configuration, and you can select one for debugging with Docker. And when I click on that, we have debugging, which is always like anticlimactic. It's like you press debugging and nothing happens because you haven't actually run your code to do anything yet. But let's go ahead into our server with Node. And I set some breakpoints. Whenever I put a hero, it's going to make a change here, and I should hit these breakpoints. So over my application, I should be logged in. And let's say I change Drax. He likes to say, nothing's over my head. I hit Save. And I've debugged into my code. So I'm now running my code locally and debugging right here inside of VS Code, looking at my values. And I barely had to do anything. That's the cool part. And I can walk through. And now I can see the response of my JSON down here. We can see Drax. And that was the renamed name we had. And then I can hit Run. I can disconnect when I want to, just like that. Pretty cool. So a lot of that, the nice thing about this is, and you'll notice, I didn't leave my editor. I like tools that allow you to stay inside of your editor and do everything in one place. VS Code lets me do that. And we ran some commands under the covers. So when I go to VS Code and I do the Docker Compose, it's running this command for me. But the next step is maybe I want to tag this image and push it up to my cloud provider. So when I tag my image, what I'm doing is I'm basically giving it a prefix. So before Papa, Im my image name, might be like Papa, my Angular app, I put the name of my registry. It's like a NPM registry for Docker containers. So I'm telling it, go ahead and go to the Azure Container Registry in this case, or you can use Docker Hub or anyone you want, and tag it for that name. This doesn't push it anywhere. It just names it. This is where you're going to go. Then I simply run push for my image. And it looks at the tag. And it will take that image locally and push it up to that registry. Now my registry is up in the cloud somewhere. Well, what registry should you use? You should use one for a company that would be private, because you want security. You don't want other people running your images. For anything that's public, like my Angular CLI image, I put that in Docker Hub. Anybody can run it. There's nothing private in there. So you pick your poison on how you want to do it. And here's just a quick example of how you do those things inside of VS Code, where you can just simply right-click it once you tag it. And then you can say, Tag Image. And then you can right-click it again and say, Push. And within seconds, it should be up inside your cloud running. Now, we can do that right from VS Code. But what happens if I'm the person doing that? And I work with Simona on my team. And I'm out to lunch, and she has a bug fix, and she's got to get it out to production. She doesn't have access to my Mac. At least, I hope she doesn't because she's dangerous. So what happens if she needs to push something out, and I'm out to lunch, or I'm taking a nap, or I'm playing with my kid, or whatever is happening, right? You're on vacation. Deploying it from your local machine is not really scalable, especially for large systems. So we need some kind of CI CD in this case. How do you put CI CD together? Well, ideally, let's think about the workflow we'd want. We'd want to be able to push to GitHub or Bitbucket or wherever our source goes. Once we make our changes, Simone is like, John's out. I'm going to push my code to GitHub. I then want some kind of a CI CD server to take that and run the build process for me. Maybe I've got unit tests or end to end tests, and I've got release schedules. There's other things that I might have. I could use Jenkins. I could use Travis. I could use CodeShip. I could use Circle CI. I can use Visual Studio Team Services. There's all sorts of CI applications out there. At Google, they use Bazel, Bazel, Bazel. 
whatever you call it these days, right? So we've got these different tools that we can use. And anything you use works. Once you get it there, we can build our Docker image. And then we push it to a container registry. So a container registry in this case might be Azure because I want it to be a private one where I've got a security to get into it. And then we just launch the web app in the cloud. So let's take a look at how we could do that. In the interest of time, I've already set up a CI server, and we'll take a look at that up here. There's a CI server. I'm running it with Visual Studio Team Services. And we'll walk through it, but let's go look at the running app in the cloud right now. If we look at the running app, let's see, where did it go? There it is. So there's a the URL. You can actually hit this yourselves. It's at papa-ng-atlanta-heroes at azurewebsites.net. Of course, you can give it a custom domain if you want. And we'll make it bigger. I'd like my dev tools to be open. We'll close it for now. And you can see when I refresh it, it just says Angular Heroes. What if I want to make a change to that? I can go down to my app component. There's my title down here. And instead, we can do something like, uh, we'll call it NG Atlanta Heroes, like that. And we'll save it. Now I'm going to push it to Git and say new title. I committed it, and I'm pushing it. Now once I push it, let's think about what's happening. I pushed it to Git. I've got a Git hook set up so that when that gets pushed up there, it's going to move over to our CI server. CI server is listening, saying, ah, there's new code. There's new code up here. I'm going to go and take that code, pull it in, look at the Docker file that we have, build that Docker image, and then push it to our container registry, which then has a web hook to tell the website, hey, this thing's ready. It's updated. We should have a new version. So let's go look at GitHub first. This is the repo here. And in this repo, I'm in my develop branch. We should see a commit that just happened a moment ago. And where is my commit? Oh, it's not in master, it's in develop. There we go. I committed just a minute ago for new title. Perfect. So once I'm in there, we can get rid of these. We can go look at our build system. And here is a job that I'm running. Zooming in, you can see there's one in progress right now for this build definition. Let's look at what this build definition is doing. There are three steps. Get my code from GitHub, build my Docker image, push it to my container registry. The same things we did in VS Code, right? The cool thing here is it's not complicated. Go get my code. Where is it? It's in GitHub. Here it is. What do I do? Run my Docker Compose. That was in my project. That was that file that we saw over here. It's like, hey, Docker Compose is going to run this Docker file, which builds all of this. Perfect. And then when it's done, it's going to push it to my container registry. So let's go look at the process of what it's doing. If we click on this build number, and any CI tool will let you kind of like watch what's happening. I think this takes about 2.8 minutes. By the way, I don't know why they measure it in 0.8 minutes. Who talks like that? So it's 2.8 minutes to generally run this and get it up there. But you can see the progress of what's happening as it's building it, which is kind of neat. And you might be asking yourself, but John, when you're running locally, you've got keys on your machine for the database and accessing Twitter for authentication and all that. How do you deploy that without putting it inside your assets in GitHub? Well, for that, we use environment flags. And the environment flags, what I do locally is I have a example, so I don't show you my keys, in .env file locally that I git ignore. None of this stuff goes to GitHub, but I run it here, so I'm running locally. It looks for that file, sees it, says, okay, these are all my settings that I need for environments. But when I go to production, on my production server, I set these environment flags up on my cloud server separately. So none of this ever gets into my GitHub or CI cycle. You don't want to be the next company on the news that got hacked, right? So once you do that, you can have all this stuff inside of Azure. How do you set those things? There's a cool extension called the Azure App Service. And inside of my web server, check this out. I'm going to hide my keys, by the way, so I'm going to shrink that down. Application settings. You can manually add application settings right here from VS Code. Say, what's my port? What's my account? What's my key? You can see the first five letters of it. There you go. Let's minimize that. So once you do that, everything's up there running. And I lied. It didn't take 2.8 minutes. It took three. 
So once it took those minutes, let's go look at what happened. If we go over to our application over here, it might be deployed already. Once it gets up to the application, the next step is it's going to push it into the website. We change the title. So if I refresh this application, once it's been there, we get a new title for the app. Pretty cool, isn't it? Hey, the cloud worked. Cool. So kind of wrapping up, what we did here is we built our stuff locally with Docker. We tested it out. We felt good about it. Then we used our favorite CI tools, whatever you want. I like my favorite personally, people ask me all the time. I like Jenkins, I like Circle CI, and I like VSTS uh, for all for different reasons. And I honestly go between the three. And then where do, you, where do you host it and how do you get it there? You can host it up there with something on Linux. You can pick your operating system or you can just use a Docker container like we did. So we kind of went through how all that worked. If you want to try it yourself, because I don't like presentations unless you can try it, you can use these links. Feel free to grab a picture of this. All these links are freely available in OSS. You can learn how to do it from the uh, documentation at the first link. You can grab my code right up here at this GitHub repo where I'm always changing the title. You can grab the extensions that we're using from the next two links. If you want to use Docker from VS Code or integrate with uh, app services with Azure from VS Code directly, you can use that fourth link. And if you don't have an Azure account, you can get a free trial right here on this page. My name is John Papa, and if you don't use great development tools, you're doing it the wrong way. Use good tools, make your life easier, and thank you for coming today.